what I want us to focus this morning on is how prayer and uh, living in the power of the Holy Spirit, how those two things come together. Because there will not be any great movement of God's Spirit in the life of us or in His church unless prayer is a focal point of our lives, unless it is the primary thing in which we do with our lives. I want us, to, uh, as we begin to think about the concept and the idea of prayer uh, and really God's desire to move and to work in our lives, so often we think is revival or we think of spiritual renewal as something that God uh, sort of holds back on us and we have to really you know, work real hard and we hope that God may move. But the reality is that God really wants to move in our lives. God really wants to move in our church. God really wants to move in this community. But it all begins with prayer. And we'll be looking at Luke chapter 11, verse 11 through verse 13. Uh, I had a friend of mine this morning, a pastor friend, text me and said, Hey man, what text are you doing this morning? I said, Well, I'm really doing sort of a topical type message, and so I'm really going to be all over the place. And he said, Oh, I don't normally preach like that. And I said, Well, if you're going to look at some doctrinal issues, you have to look at more than one passage. So we're going to do that today. Um, Luke 11, verse 11 through verse 13. Jesus says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let's pray together. Father, I just pray, Lord, in the quietness of this moment, Lord, that you would steal my heart. Be God, that you'd give me the words that I need to say today, Lord, that the words that I need to hear and also the words that uh, your church needs to hear uh, in this place today. Father, we pray that you would move in our lives, that, God, that you would challenge us, God, that you would encourage us, that, Father, if need be, that you would even might rebuke us in this moment. Father, we pray that, um, I just ask, God, that, that my opinions and my thoughts will be put to the back burner, Lord, and that, that only those things that bring you glory and only those things that you would have me to say would be the things that I say here today. We pray these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. As we think about this story where Jesus talks about prayer, he begins by asking a very, really a series of questions about an earthly father. Then he asks the questions, you know, what earthly father, if his child were to ask for a fish, would give him a snake? Any dads, you'd do that? Your son asked for a fish, you'd give him a snake? Any of you? One, I, I can't hardly stand snakes. I start st st stuttering just thinking about a snake. I mean, I get ready to go to bed the other night, and I'm doing my, the stupid thing I do sometimes. I get the phone, and I'm going through, and this thing on dangerous things or dangerous animals. Of course, some, most of them weren't animals, but a lot of them were like snakes, and like this one snake, you know, it bites you, and there's no antivenom, and you could die like in 30 minutes, and it's like a painful death. And so uh, that was not the kind of thoughts I needed to go to bed with. But what, what earthly father, Jesus asked, would give his child a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child were to ask for an egg, would give him a scorpion? I don't think any of us would do that. And so Jesus says that if we who are evil, we who struggle with a corrupt nature, know how to give good things to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father know what good gifts He wants to give us? And then He directly correlates this with the giving of the Holy Spirit. He says that if we ask Him, that He will give us the Holy Spirit to those of us who ask. In the story, the believers are identified as small children. The, the Greek word here that talks about children is the, it's really the word that identifies that age group of like a toddler. Those who are really dependent upon others to meet their needs. But also like toddlers, sometimes we think we don't need any help, right? I mean, as toddlers, we need help with everything. But also like toddlers, we think we got it all put together. We know, we know how to get the pot full of boiling water off the stove. We can do it by ourselves until we dump it on our head. And so we think about this parable, this story that Jesus tells about prayer, that we are like that child who is completely and totally dependent upon God for our every need. But here we see our Heavenly Father being viewed as a loving Father who is always watching over His children, desiring to give them what they have asked, giving them those things that they need. I was talking to a friend of mine this week about prayer, and he was saying that there's this false idea in the church that, that God is like this big Santa Claus in heaven. All we have to do is write our list out to Him, and He's going to start giving us everything that we ask and the reality of prayer is that it's not so much about me asking to get things for myself, but it's asking God to move into work in my life so that I might be busy about His work and fulfilling His desires and His will. But the reason that we so often struggle with remaining consistent in our prayer lives is really, it's really I think, boils down to one of two things why we struggle. 
One is that we're unaware of our real need. We're like that toddler that thinks we've got it all together when in reality we do not. And so oftentimes we don't go, Lord, in prayer because we think, I can handle this. I got this. God, I'll, I'll call out to you when everything's get real bad, but this thing I can handle on my own. And we know where that always leads. The other reason that we struggle with a consistent prayer life is that we don't believe that God is willing or he is able to help us. Either he is uncaring or he doesn't have the power and the authority to bring about change in our life. We really begin to grasp and understand our need, how desperate we really are for God to move and to work in our lives, to accomplish everything that must be done in our lives. And we really begin to understand that God is loving and God is willing and that he is able to help us. It is then that prayer becomes as natural for us as breathing. I mean, none of us have to sit around and think, you know, Golly, Lord, it's been about three hours since the last time I breathed. You know, I really need to try to remember to do that. It becomes natural. And so as we really begin to understand and grasp our true need, how desperate we are for God to work and move in our lives. And as we begin to understand his care and his power, it is then that we begin to pray. Our prayer life becomes as normal as breathing. But when we are controlled by pride and doubt, we find ourselves struggling to pray. So I want us to, to really focal point this morning is to look at the connection between prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. As we prepare to move into 2018, that seems so weird to say that we're almost at 2018 if the Lord tarries his coming. But I really want us to focus as we move into this coming year to really pray as a church what the prophet Habakkuk prayed. We looked at this several weeks ago in Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2. He said, Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. What we think about what Habakkuk says here, he says, Lord, I've, I've heard in the past about how you delivered your people through the Exodus. You delivered us from Egypt. Lord, I've heard all these stories about how you led the people across the wilderness. We heard all these stories. But Lord, in this day, Father, I want to see you work in my day in the day in which we live, to see a great movement. We've, we've read stories about the first great awakening and the second great awakening in America. We hear stories and tales of God doing miraculous things all over the world. But let us pray that God would do this in our day, that we would see a great movement of God's Spirit in the life of Southside Baptist Church and even the other churches, the Christian churches in our community, in our area, that there would be this great movement of God's power upon our community that we would see Believers sold out for Jesus and people who don't know Christ coming to know him. It's the two primary things I want us to focus on this morning is two things. One, uh, every major spiritual awakening in the Bible was connected to intense times of prayer. You won't see a movement of God's spirit without prayer. Prayer always precedes the movement. Go back and even read through the Gospels. Look at the great movements of Jesus. Every time there was a great movement in, in the life of Christ, Every time there's a great miracle, it was always preceded by a time of prayer where Jesus set himself apart to seek the Father's face and to seek his direction. And so every major spiritual awakening, every great revival throughout the Bible was always connected to intense times of prayer. And then I want us to look at five things the Bible shows the Holy Spirit does when he shows up. And these are things that he alone can do. And so I want us to begin by focusing on the connection between prayer and prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, we talked about this, and we could, I mean, I could, in fact, I cut out about three different passages out of this part, too. As we walk through the Old and New Testament, we see over and over again that spiritual awakening and revival are always preceded with intense prayer. We begin the book of, Jude, of Judges. In the book of Judges, we find Israel going through a spiritual cycle. The Bible says in chapter 21, verse 24, it ends, the book ends with this word, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We think about this spiritual cycle that went through the life of Israel. And we see how much it really honestly looks like much of the church in America today. The people's hearts would grow cold toward God. And then they would begin to move away from the worship of God. They began to chase all of these other idols. And they began to ch chase themselves and began to do what felt good for themselves. They no longer focused on what was best for the nation or what was, what was God's will for their lives. Instead, they began to focus on what's in it for me. And what can I do for myself? And I think in the aspect of worshiping all these little idols, these idols that were made of wood, of stone, of metal, those idols, I think the real, the real purpose or the real focal point was not the little idols. The focal point was the heart, a heart that had grown cold, a heart that had grown hard as it moved away from God. And that because they're obeying, God would do what? 
The people rebel and God punishes them, right? God disciplines his children. And oftentimes we see that where God uh, removes his blessing, his presence upon their life. We see they go through times of drought, pestilence. Oftentimes God would send an enemy in to come and to take over the country. They would be ruled by one of their enemies. And then in desperation, the people would begin to cry out to God, and God would raise up a deliverer to come and rescue them from their enemies. Over and over again through the book of Judges, we see this same scenario going on and on. Listen, desperate prayers always precede God's deliverance of prayer. It's only whenever we begin to be desperate for God, it's only when we begin to see that we are totally dependent upon Him, that we truly begin to call out for Him to come and to work and move in our lives when we are desperate. We move to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. King Solomon dedicates a temple. You may remember the story that David, Solomon's father, wanted to build a temple. And what did God say? No, right? I saw a couple of miles ago, but most of you were real quiet. I guess I need to start putting like a cheat sheet in the bulletin or something, like keywords, you'll know what to say. God had told David, no. He said, no, it won't be you. It's going to be your son, Solomon, who's going to build the temple. And so the temple has been built. Uh, Solomon gathers the people there to dedicate the temple to the Lord. Uh, and really, it was a high point in the history of the nation of Israel. And Solomon begins this dedication service with prayer. And the Bible says that God sent fire from heaven, and the glory, the Shekinah glory of God, began to fill the temple. God's presence was there with great power and great anointing. And the people began to bow in reverence and fear before a holy and a righteous God. And they began to praise, and they began to worship the Lord. And then in chapter 7, we're told that the Lord appeared to Solomon and told him that whenever the people wander away from him, when that happens, that he will remove his blessing from them, that the heavens will be shut, and they will experience times of drought and pestilence. But God says in verse 14 and verse 15, a verse that we often see, we see it printed, we see it on signs. And the, the Christian Standard Bible translates it this way, My people who bear my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. My eyes will now be open and my ears attentive to prayer from this place. So when does God show up? The people rebel, but when does God show up? What? Repent and what else? Prayer, right? When you, rep- when you turn, when you pray and seek my face and turn from your ways, which is repentance, when you pray and when you repent, God says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive your sin and heal your land. My eyes will now be open and my ears will be attentive, 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 like that, attentive to prayer from this place. When the people pray and turn from their evil ways, then God shows up with great power. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we find the people of Israel have once again abandoned the commands of God. They've turned from God to back to the worship of Baal. And some of them are actually even wavering between God and Baal. They're, they're basically doing, honestly, like us a lot of times. We're trying to hold on to the things of the world and the things of God at the same time, and we can't do that, can we? God said it's impossible because we can only love one master. We can't love two. And so the people find themselves wavering between God and Baal. King Ahab had, was an evil king who sought after the gods of Baal and did evil in the sight of God. The Bible says Elijah prays and God shuts up the heavens where there is no rain. And then the prophet of God issues a challenge to the 400 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. He challenges these, these prophets, these false prophets, to come and to gather at the mount. And there they are to build an, off, build an altar, and they have two, two, cattle, that they're, two cows that they're to sacrifice on the altar, one on theirs and one on Elijah's. Remember the story? They're to, to build the altar. They put the animal on the sacrifice, and they are to cry out to their God, that he would send fire from heaven and consume that sacrifice. So the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asher, they begin to dance around and cry out to their God. What happens? Nothing. This is probably one of my favorite stories in the Bible because I just love how Elijah responds. He begins to mock them and make fun of them. He says, hey, maybe you need to scream a little louder. Maybe he's asleep and he can't hear you. Then then they say, then Elijah says, well, Maybe he's in the bathroom, and the door's shut, and he can't hear you. Maybe you need to scream a little louder. Maybe he's gone on vacation. And so he continued to mock them. They began to cut themselves and scream and holler, and yet there is no answer from their God. Then it comes Elijah's turn. And 
He rebuilds the altar of the Lord, the, the altar that King Ahab had torn down. He rebuilds that altar. He places the sacrifice on the altar. And then he digs a trench around the altar. And he, he commands his servants to begin to pour water on the wood and the sacrifice. They pour so much water on it that the trenches become full of water. Look what it says in verse 36 and verse 37 of 1 Kings 18. At, that time for, at the time for offering the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. What is the importance of that? He said some new God that just popped out of the air somewhere. He's saying, you, you have been the God of our people from Abraham, from Isaac, from Israel, that you have been our God. He says, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you have turned, and you have turned their hearts back to you. Elijah finishes praying, no fire comes. Now, that's not how the story goes, right? No, wait for somebody to say, heretic, heretic, false prophet. No, the Bible says that fire falls from heaven and consumes both the sacrifice and the wood. It, sacrifice, it burns up not only the sacrifice, but also the altar on which it has been placed. The Bible says the people begin to fall on their face and begin to worship the Lord the one true God. And then later in the story, Elijah prays and the Lord sends rain. Of course, the part that I skipped in between there is the 400 prophets and the 400 prophets are what happens to them. Yeah, they are killed, right? The people slaughter them. We jump into the book of Nehemiah. The people have been in captivity in Babylon when God used Nehemiah, the cupbearer of the king, to deliver his people from bondage. In verse 8, we're told the people were called to an assembly, to a solemn assembly, where Ezra the priest began to stand and began to read the word of God to the people. The minute he begins to read, the people all stand up as the word of God is being read. And they begin to weep over their sin. And they begin to call out to God that he might deliver them from their sin. This and over and over again throughout the Old Testament, we see God's people turning their hearts from God, going and doing their own things. Because of that, God takes away his hand of blessing the people begin to see how dependent they are upon God. They begin to cry out to God. And God, in his love and concern for his people, sends a deliverer to come and rescue them from their situation. As we move in the New Testament, we find really this same pattern. The Holy Spirit responding to the prayer of God's people. I'll be honest, this, is one, this first part, I never really had noticed this. I'm not going to tell you how many times I've read this passage over the last 52 years of my life. But uh, in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22... It tells that this is, during, this is during Jesus' baptism. It says, when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And as he was praying, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. What happened before the Holy Spirit descended from heaven as a dove? Jesus prayed, right? I honestly had never really paid attention to that until I was working through this message for today, that as Jesus was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Listen, it was Jesus, pray the hev as Jesus was praying, the heavens are opened, and God's Spirit descends. I think that's important. I, I mean, if not, why would that be in the story? Why would it tell us that Jesus was praying? I think it's because pr there's such a strong connection between prayer and the Holy Spirit moving and working in our lives, in our church, in our community. In the book of Acts, we're told the promise of the Holy Spirit's coming at, at, about the Holy Spirit's coming at Pentecost. We looked at it over the last couple of weeks about Jesus had made the promise in the Gospel of John that he was going to send a comforter to come and be with them. And it, it was important that he go away to be with the Father. In, um, in Acts, the, uh, Luke gives us clear insight into what the church was doing as they waited the Holy Spirit coming. In Acts 1, verse 14, it says, They were all continuing, continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. We think about this. Before the Holy Spirit, who Jesus said would be our counselor, he'd be our comforter, he'd be our advocate, before he came, we find the disciples doing what? All right, this isn't rocket science. Praying, right? I mean, that's the whole focal point of this point is praying. 
They were praying continually. They were together. They were praying continually. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't some just a prayer time that was set aside on Monday night once a month. It wasn't just prayer that was set aside on Wednesday night. It wasn't just prayer in a worship service. But instead, they were continually praying that God's Spirit would come. And so we again find the coming of the Spirit preceded by prayer. We jump to Acts chapter 4. Peter and John have been... Uh, at the temple, they, they heal a man who has been crippled from birth, and they're preaching the gospel about a resurrected Lord. And the, the, the religious authorities are happy about it, right? No, they're angry, they're upset. So they arrest them, they bring them in, and they command, the religious leaders begin to command them to no longer speak about this Jesus, no longer speak in his name. And how did, how did they respond? How did Peter and John respond? What was their response? Anybody remember from Acts 4? Am I to obey God or man, right? Man has said, don't speak. God has said to speak. And so Peter and John say, who am I to obey, you or God? What's important? And they said, we can't even fathom the idea. We've seen God's spirit work and move with such great power. I I can't, they were like, man, it blow my mind, even the concept that I would remain quiet. How can I not tell others about what God has done in in our lives? You know, we talked about it. You've probably heard the illustration before. If, if one of us were to come up with a cure for cancer, could you keep it to yourself? Well, somebody said no. Is that, is that you? Jordan would share it. The rest of y'all going to be quiet. Yeah, we, we couldn't wait to tell everybody, man, I've got the cure. You no longer have to go through the suffering. They're like, how, how, could, we, how could we be quiet? It's impossible to do that. And then they're threatened, they're released, they return to their friends and reported to them what had happened, all that had happened that day. And they begin to pray for boldness to continue to speak the word of the Lord. In chapter 4, verse 31, it says, When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. Listen, as you study throughout the Bible, over and over again, every great move of the Holy Spirit is always connected to an intense time of prayer. Reminded of the words of D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And I don't use a whole lot of quotes very often, but this one I thought was very powerful. He was a pastor at the Westminster Chapel in London for almost 30 years. And I have it on the screen because uh, you can follow along. It's, he says, The inevitable and constant preliminary to revival has always been a thirst for God, a thirst, a living thirst for the knowledge of the living God, and a longing and a burning to see him acting, manifesting himself and his power, rising and scattering his enemies. And then he continues, Our problem is getting to a place where we realize how absolutely impotent we are. And that is strong, isn't it? That the, what precedes revival is us coming to a place to understand how absolutely impotent we really are. That it's not about the great preaching of a pastor or even his terrible preaching. It's not about the worship. It's not about any of those things. It's not even about how great and mighty or how great you are in speaking, whether you're an extrovert or an introvert. The whole point is that we are absolutely impotent to make about great change in our community. He says, at first, we persist in thinking that we can set the situation right. We think if we just write a new book, preach some better sermons, start some new mission works, adopt a new program, this will stem the tide of the enemy. But we come to realize at long last that it is not working, at least not effectively to stem the tide and save our children or our community. And he continues. And then we remember the promise. Then when when the enemy comes like a flood, it is the Lord who will raise up a standard against him. This, this passage he refers to about the Lord rising up a standard against the enemy is found in Isaiah chapter 59. You may remember that Isaiah 59 begins with the question where it says, Is the Lord's arm too short to save? And the answer to that is what? Is the, arms, is the Lord's arm too short to save? And of course it is not. And so God begins to lay out in Isaiah 59 about how it was the people's sin that had separated them from their God and that because of their sin, because of their rebellion, it's that God had not been listening to their prayers. That he closed his ears, he closed his eyes not to hear their cries. And then the Lord sees that there was no one to intercede for them. And God declares that he will be their redeemer. And he said that he would come and that he would bring salvation. Who is this talking about? It's talking about Jesus, right? Jesus came. Jesus was, was part of the Godhead. He's part of the Trinity who came and took on human flesh and came and dwelt among us that he might save us from our sins. And then in verse 19, I'm using the New King James because there's several different translations. There's a certain phrase in this part 
that uh, was the last phrase that, that there's some debate about how it should be translated. Not the intent, but really the talk about whether it's a standard or not, the focal point. He says in verse 19, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. What is, what is God saying to the prophet there? That we face an enemy that comes with great power and he comes to work and to cause all kind of havoc and destruction around us. But the Spirit of the Lord, that he will rise up as a standard. The other translate, t- translations talk about he will ra- rise up as a mighty wave. Either way, he, God will rise up to battle against the enemy for us. This is the picture of Isaiah as God fighting and overcoming the force of evil who are attempting to engulf and destroy the world. This is in Isaiah 59, we find the believers in a battle with the force of evil. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he is doing that all around us, isn't he? He is stealing, he is killing, and he is destroying. And what we need in our country today is a great movement of God's Spirit to come and to rise up and to engulf the enemy and to fight him off. Listen, we try real hard. And every now and then we may even win a battle or so. But it seems that we're unable to stop the enemy. But it's in our desperation we throw ourselves upon the mercy of God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your cares on him because he what? He cares for you. We so often, I mean, I, I use this verse all the time. God has used it in my life personally to remind me of his care and his love for me and that he wants me to cast all my concerns upon him. Even the things that you may think are small and insignificant, God says bring all your concerns, bring all your worries to me. But when you begin to look at the context that surrounds this verse, it's found, within the, it's found within the context of the people of God, the children of God, suffering for the cause of Christ. They are under great persecution. There is great suffering that is going on. And God says, listen, things are difficult. And I may not drag you, I may not jerk you out of the midst of the suffering and the hardship that you're going through, but I will walk with you through it. And so cast your cares upon me because I care for you. But then in verse 8 and verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 5, God says to, to Peter, he says, Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. It says, resist him, firm in the faith. Listen, whenever the enemy rises up against us, we must throw ourselves upon the mercy of God because then the Holy Spirit will rise up like a flood both in us, through us, and around us to fight back the enemy around us. And it's in his power we overcome the enemy and we advance the cause of Christ. You may say, but pastor, I'm, I'm weak. I'm insecure. I've got all these struggles in my life. What I would say to you today is that God uses the weak to confound the wise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we find the apostle Paul pleading for the Lord to remove his thorn in the flesh. And the Lord finally tells him in verse 9, I, I guess he kept beating that throne so many times that God finally said, well, I've got to tell him something. In verse 9, he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Some people all the time, they say this thing, this, this false statement that God will never put anything on you more than you can bear. Listen, that is not reality, is it? Is that what he promises us, that we'll never have anything more upon us? Tell that to the, tell that to the believer who was placed on the stake and burned alive because he refused to renounce the name of Christ. Tell that to the believer in some of these countries around the world today that, that their heads are chopped off and they are tortured because of their faith in Christ. And they're told if they will back up, if they will move away from the things of God, that God will, that they will allow them to live or they will allow them to die quick and painless death. In the midst of that, God says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in weakness. Listen, the question for each of this morning is this. Are we there yet? Have we come to a place that we realize, we recognize it, that all of our best deeds, all of our best work is not enough? We can't save our marriage. We can't save our children. Only God can do those things. And in our desperation, we must call out to him. And we must lean upon his power and his strength at work in us. Listen, church, are we at this place? Listen, what we need is not better strategies, not better programs, or even better sermons. I guess that could be up for debate about the better sermons. Listen, all those things are good, and I don't want you to misunderstand me. We are to develop plans and strategies. That's what we should do. We are to plan for the battle before us. We need to develop programs that will help us fulfill our mission, and our mission is to do what? To know Christ and to make him known, right? We should be developing plans and strategies and programs to help us accomplish our mission. It may even would help if you had better preaching. But the truth is we need something more. 
We need something more than the best that we have to offer. That's what we need. What we, what we are to hung, hunger for in our lives, in our church, in our community, is the mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. Is God's Spirit is at work in and through us that He begins to bring about the change. Listen, that doesn't mean that we're to sit on the sidelines and do nothing, does it? We're to walk in faith, but we understand that we are totally and completely dependent upon Him. It's like that little, it's like that little child that can scoot around, man. He can move so fast you can't really keep up with him. But then you get ready to pick him up to, to let him walk a little bit on his own. What you're holding his hand, and he's, you know, trying to make that little step. That's us. We're not just to sit down. Instead, with God holding on to us, we are to keep walking, keep moving to accomplish what God has called for us to do. And that is to bring about the furthering of God's kingdom here on earth. Listen, this will only come through intense prayer as we commit ourselves to praying for the power of God to work and move in our life and in our church. Real quickly, five things that come through intense prayer. Or or five things the Holy Spirit does when He is present. Sorry. Things that only He can do. The first thing the Holy Spirit convicts, we looked at this passage a couple of weeks ago. John 16, verse 8 and verse 11. When He comes, He will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they did not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And about judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. You know, as a preacher, it's real easy sometimes to try to move into the place of the Holy Spirit and you try to convict people about their sin, the struggles in their life. But the reality is only the Holy Spirit can do that, right? I mean, we can manipulate. I mean, there's some guys that are really good at it. Man, they can have everybody in this place crying and bawling. They're like, they're like a Hallmark commercial. I mean, you just be booing, boo-hooing, and bawling, and then you leave here unchanged. It's not about the skill of the minister. It's about the Holy Spirit of God bringing about change in people's lives. It's the Holy Spirit who makes the things of eternity real. He opens our spiritual lives so that we can see the unpleasantness of sin. This and sin will take you further or farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. And there's more truth to that than we really want to deal with at times. He convicts us about the horror of sin. The Holy Spirit also opens our our spiritual eyes to the beauty of Jesus and his righteousness. Listen, he alone, only Christ, can serve as that perfect sacrifice. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. It requires a perfect sacrifice, and Jesus is the only one who can take away the sin debt of the world. And the Holy Spirit is one who not only convicts us about our sin, but he also reminds us, he convicts us about Jesus and how beautiful he is and all that he did and endured for us that we could be reconciled in our relationship with God. But he also opens our spiritual eyes to the reality of judgment. The Bible says it is appointed for people to die once, and after this, judgment. Listen, God's judgment upon sin is imminent. It is coming. It is closer than we could ever imagine. John Piper says that the sign of the fullness of the Spirit is quick and frequent conviction of sin, both the sin of commission and the sin of omission. You know, so often we want to focus on the sin of commission. We, want to, we can point out everybody else's sin, right? We can, we can point out their struggles. We can point out all the major things that are going on in our life, but so often we miss out on our sins. Now listen, just as it's wrong for us to go out and get drunk, it's just as wrong for us not to share the gospel with people, isn't it? The sin of omission and the sin of commission are both a front to God. James says in James 4, 17, it is, So it is sin to know the good and yet not to do it. Listen, the Holy Spirit convicts, but the Holy Spirit also creates all. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit filled the church, we're told in verse 43 that everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. This is when the Holy Spirit comes, he creates all, both inside and outside the church. He creates a sense of God's presence that overwhelms us with feelings of awe, fear, and worship before a holy and a righteous God. I think one of the greatest things in the church of America today that we have lost sight of, we, we have so tried to tone down this idea of fear that we've lost sight of the greatness and the largeness of God. That we sin and we just you know, flippantly just say a little prayer and we go on like nothing ever happened, not understanding that what we have done has been an affront to Almighty God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who created us, God who loves us and desires for us to walk in fellowship with Him, but He also calls for His people to be holy and to be righteous, to walk in holiness. We are to be holy as He is holy, Peter tells us. When the Holy Spirit comes, 
we become aware of God's largeness and we become aware of His glory. The third thing is the Holy Spirit transforms appetites. The Holy Spirit gives us a new heart for the things of God. Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to not our good pleasure, but according to His good pleasure. A lot of folks believe that Christianity is a have-to religion. But in reality, the Holy Spirit doesn't just compel us to do what is right, but He gives us the desire to do the right thing. The Bible says that the natural man, the man of the flesh, cannot understand, cannot obey the things of God. But the spiritual man has a heart for God and has a heart to live for God. But there's maybe a battle going on between us, but there, there is an ultimate feeling, an ultimate desire to please God and to love Him and to love the things that He loves. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul explains that the Holy Spirit does what the law could never do. The law instructs us between what is right and what is wrong. The law serves as a measuring stick to show us that we fall short of God's glory. Isn't that what the book of Romans teaches us, right? That all of us fall short of God's glory. All of us fall short of the mark. We don't just miss the mark. We fall short of the mark, way short of the mark. The law can instruct us. It can point us in the right way, but only the Spirit of God can empower us to do what is right and to like it. The Bible tells in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, the Spirit gives us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit of God. Only the Spirit of God living in us can allow us to produce those fruits. The fourth thing is the, fourth thing is the Holy Spirit manifests God's power. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul gives a description of a Spirit-filled service. He says an unbeliever comes into contact with the church and the Holy Spirit is working in and through the members in such powerful way that they begin to speak words of supernatural insight and prophecy in the life of this unbeliever. In verse 25, Paul says, the secrets of his heart will be revealed. And as a result, he will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming God is really among you. And the picture here is that as we allow the Holy Spirit to come in us, and we know that he comes with all this power, as we begin to allow him to have control over us, that may be a better way to put it, as we begin to allow him to fill us and to empower us, to, to lead us into God, as we begin to follow and obey him, that God oftentimes will give us supernatural insight into the life in particular of an unbeliever, even upon a Christian who is backslidden, who, a believer who is walking away from God, where all of a sudden we know what to say and we know what to pray. And they're blown away and they think only God could know my heart like that. They begin to sense and realize the presence of God living in you, and they're driven to worship the Lord. Not because of you, but because of the Holy Spirit living in you. The fifth thing is the Holy Spirit empowers the church. The Apostle Paul says the Holy Spirit gives gifts to the church. Matter of fact, he says in another passage that he gives them as he wills. Look at what he says in Ephesians four eleven through verse 13. And he, and he, talking about the Holy Spirit, Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. And so what Paul says here is the Holy Spirit empowers us with the ability to be able to help one another, that he, he gifts us, he empowers us, he equips us to be able to help one another. We help one another to do what? To grow up in our relationship with God that we are to continue to grow in Him. It's not just about becoming saved so we got fire insurance, we know heaven's our home, but instead the point of salvation that we might grow to be like Christ. And, and God empowers us to help each other to grow in that relationship. But He also empowers us to help one another to do the work of ministry in the body of Christ. Listen, all of us have different gifts, and, gifts, and that's another sermon for another time to go into the detail of that. But all of us have different gifts, and those gifts have been given so that we might not only be an encouragement to the body of Christ, but that we might help each other do the work of ministry, to equip each other and to encourage each other to do the work of ministry within the body of Christ. But also God empowers, the Holy Spirit empowers us to build up His church through fulfilling the Lord's mission, which is to seek and to save the lost. That's what we need in our lives and in Southside is a real revival. And I'm not talking about when you hear the word revival, what immediately comes to mind? Some revival meetings, right? I remember, I mean, I, I'm still, I, well, I guess I'm old enough to remember when I was a wee little cha chap, uh, when we had week-long revivals. Some of you are old enough to you remember when you used to have them two or three weeks, right? Um, I remember we had them all week long. Later on in ministry, I remember in days we'd have, we'd have a fall revival, we'd have a spring revival. And those things were good. 
But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about a half week where we come together to hear preaching and that we, we, you know, it's a special time. It's almost like a camp meeting where we get stirred up for the Lord, and those things are good at different times. But what I'm talking about here is a supernatural movement of God's Spirit in our lives and the life of this church. This revival is characterized by two things. First of all, it's characterized by repentance. It is characterized by repentance. Listen, what habits, what sins are you hiding? Do you remember the story of Achan in the Old Testament? Israel goes out to fight an enemy that they should be able to beat on their own, an enemy that was much smaller, much weaker than they are, but instead they lose the battle. Why do they lose the battle? Do you remember? They were sitting in the camp because of Achan's sin, right? Achan, had, God had told them not to take anything, and they, they disobeyed and they took it anyway. And he began to hide it. And because of that, because of the sin of the one, the whole nation suffered. Listen, when God's presence becomes real, sin becomes intolerable. I read this week about a story from Dr. Charlie Culpepper's book called The Shantung Revival, which was in the northern, uh, it was a Shantung province in North China back in the 1930s. That one of the missionaries, before she came on the field, had stolen 25 cents from somebody. And, uh, and they were in a, a prayer meeting, and I forget, one of the lady missionaries was leading the meeting, and she began to challenge them to get along with God until they feel God's presence move in their lives. She begins to pray and to seek the Lord. And she becomes so overwhelmed with fear because of an unconfessed sin in her life, stealing a quarter, 25 cents, that she immediately left the presence of God. She ran from his presence because she was so overwhelmed by his holiness in his righteousness. Listen, when God's presence becomes real in our lives, sin becomes intolerable. We have to deal with it. Listen, every great revival in history has been characterized by repentance. I made reference to Dr. Charlie Culpepper's book, The Shantung Revival. But you can go on and read over and over again. The one thing that characterized revival, in particular this one in China, was the awareness of God's holiness, that it impelled believers under the conviction of the Holy Spirit to seek Christ's forgiveness. Sin's horror became unbelievably evident. The weight of their sin became so real that it had to be dealt with. And so I want to encourage you this morning not to be like Achan and try to cover up your sin, not to try to hide it. But instead, if we will seek the Lord, if we will seek his forgiveness, he's promised that he will forgive us if we repent of our sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This revival is characterized by repentance, but it also is characterized by prayer. Listen, we will never experience a supernatural movement of God's Spirit in this place without intense prayer. In New York City in 1857, a guy named, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, Jeremiah Lan Lanfear, he was hired to visit a local neighborhood and bring people to Christ. He was working with a church there in New York City. And he became very discouraged and frustrated. And when he was frustrated, he turned to prayer and he he finally found himself experiencing the presence of God. And so one day he put out a sign and invited people to come and to pray. There would be no preaching, no sermon, just praying. The first Wednesday, six people showed up. The second Wednesday, 20 people showed up. The third Wednesday, 40 people showed up. And somebody said, hey, well, let's do this every day. The story goes that two months later, the whole auditorium was filled with hundreds of people praying every day at noon. So they started other prayer meetings at noon. Soon, the entire downtown area of New York City, every theater, every church was filled with men and women who were praying. Reporters estimated up to 10,000 people were praying every day in lower Manhattan. Churches began having evening service, and people started coming and receiving Christ. In a nine-month period, 50,000 people came to Christ at a time when the population of New York City was about 800,000. We think about New York City, we think about our numbers today, and we say, 50,000, that's not a big deal. 50,000 in a city that was made up of 800,000. 50,000 people came to know Christ. Listen again, here's our prayer. It's 2,500 years old. It's from the prophet Habakkuk. Lord, I've heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years. In your wrath, remember mercy. How do we pray? How do we pray this prayer? We pray and ask God that he would open our eyes that we might see him. That we see beyond all the junk. We'd, we move beyond the forest. We really begin to see God. We'd pray that we would not just hear reports about God, about the great things that he's done in the past or things he's done somewhere else, but that we want to experience firsthand 
his spirit moving in our lives. Pray that we would fear him, that we repent of all of our known sin and we become very sensitive to every, every time he convicts us, and that we would burn with passion for the glory of his name, that our lives will be consumed with glorifying him and we can't glorify him and have unconfessed sin in our life. We'd also pray for his mercy. His mercy not only to us, but for those who are all around us. That we cry out to the Lord and ask him to revive us again. As we come to the end of this service this morning, I want us to, to spend a few moments. I'm going to ask Jordan if he would to come and just, just play. Don't, don't sing anything, Jordan. If you would, just play for a few moments. And I just want to encourage us to pray. That we would pray that God would do something in the life of our church. Um, you know, it's so easy to move into a place of complacency. It's so easy to move into a place where we ignore some little things in our life, that those little things keep us from walking in intimacy with God. And so I want us to spend a few moments just praying, asking God's Spirit to convict us and to move and show us anything in our lives that's not what it ought to be. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, if I, you know, man, I, I may be a churchman, but I know, I know that I'm not really saved. I know that if I were to die today, I wouldn't go into God's presence. And the Bible says a day is a day of, of salvation. Because after death, then comes judgment. Then it's the day of judgment. It'll be too late. And so today is the day of salvation. I ask you to come and to ask him to come be the Lord of your life. Maybe you have somebody in your life you want to come and pray for. Maybe you have something in your own personal life you need to pray over. Something in your work that God has burdened you with. The Bible says to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. Let's pray together.